WBEZ is supported by Chopin Theater, celebrating 25 years and almost 2,000 different events. Roundtable breakfast discussions about Wicker Park as a national destination takes place Saturday, December 17th. More at ChopinTheater.com. To, to steal any time from him, but Gia, perhaps from your perspective. Sure. <laughs> I think is to just set up a little bit of framing on Jane Jacobs, and I think she is, you know, has had a hundred years of influence, um, and there are there's probably very little I could tell folks who are interested in her legacy um, that would be new to you. But maybe just to set it into context of a little bit of her background, which of course, you know, she was a journalist, an activist, an author. I think those are probably three words that characterize her best. This very busy diagram, which I'm happy to send to anyone. It's not mine. It's from uh, it's curbed. Um, that they put together in, in time for the anniversary, uh, the 100th year anniversary, um, has a couple of key pieces to it that I think um, are emblematic of what she was trying to suggest made cities vibrant and great. Um, and one was, of course, was population density, that there's a certain critical mass of bodies that you want to have in your neighborhoods. Um, and that in that density, there's also a level of diversity that you want. And I think um, something struck Something struck me in what the alderman was saying uh, before, and maybe a little bit of, of Ziggy's um, conversation about what it means when people kind of move into neighborhoods and the storefronts change, and you're walking actually past the theater to go to the dog food store because it's just kind of part of your services, and you're not even acknowledging the fact that there's this kind of other set of vibrant uses there. Oops, so I flip back. Um, and one of the things that um, she talked about is not just the idea that lots of people are there, but it's the idea that there are local people there and non-local people there together. So it's not, I, this is what I was thinking, Ziggy, your, our conversation about Michigan Avenue, right? There's something totally different about walking down Michigan Avenue that has lots of shops and things than there is walking down, say, Milwaukee Avenue over here. And it's that kind of face-to-face -face relationships that are happening between people who who maybe own property there, who live there, who operate the storefronts with one another, and that's helping with social cohesion just at a neighborhood scale. But then also strangers can be there too. And so that kind of, that's the kind of diversity uh, in some ways that she was talking about. You want that collection, and that was something at the time that really differentiated from a suburban experience where um, you know, in dense urban settings you have, in a way, almost a, a privacy in all of that commotion of different lived experiences. In a suburban place, you're really isolated from it. So in order to have those, any interaction, it's usually a, a very private interaction at the first blush, meaning in order to talk to people or to just see anybody different than, from yourself, you actually have to make a full-on relationship with them to do it. 
In a city, you can just bump into people, and there's something to that. I, mean, I think another um, piece that, let's see, that, uh, two things. Um, one, this idea of mixed uses. Uh, and that is something that we say very casually now in urban planning circles. We have mixed use development, mixed use development. And she was one of the uh, people really on the front end of that idea and talking about you want to have that, that feel of different spaces and culture and arts, but also I, you know, I need to pick up bread and milk and there are other activities that I have there. And it's that diversity of experiences uh, from sort of this use perspective that mixture makes places really vibrant and livable. Um, and then there's a sort of an interesting piece about old buildings. So um, at the time uh, when she was writing, it wasn't necessarily perceived that historic buildings were of the same value that we might perceive them as now. You think about uh, Robert Moses uh, trying to, you know, knocking down Lincoln Center, for example, wanting to do that. Um, those are the kinds of conversations being had. Wipe out the old in the way for the new. And so at the time she was saying, no, preserve historic buildings because then, because they have no value as, or as much value as a new building, they're actually probably more affordable. Which now we would say that's just crazy talk. That's not how it works anymore um, in cities where people, in neighborhoods where people want to be. Um, and then I think the last uh, major piece, oh, and I should say, you see those little uh, glasses down there, eyes on the street. That's, um, if you pay attention to Jane Jacobs, that's a refrain that you'll hear coming out. And what's, so Eyes on the Street is about once you have that vibrancy and people and strangers, people who know each other on the same street, that there's safety in that kind of experience, that the more people we have using those streets, the less isolated people are, the more likely someone is to help you in a crisis. Um, and I'll get into it, just a little bit of critique later on, but I think um, there's also lots of research now about sometimes in a crisis, the more people you have around, the less likely someone is to do something, because it's kind of the tragedy of the commons. Everyone thinks someone else will do it. Um, but that, I think, eyes on the street, and then I, as I was mentioning, between population density and mixed uses, um, ballet of the sidewalk, that was another key phrase um, that uh, is illustrative of her thinking, that in that, the mix of uses and the mix of people and the density happening there that you get this sort of beautiful dance, this experience on the sidewalk um, that helps make it vibrant and want to be there. And then short blocks. Um, and that seems like a very simple um, principle, but if you pay attention to the conversations about walkability, for example, um, there's a lot in urban planning circles, it's, you know, what is within a 10 minute walk of you? I think in Detroit, they're talking about 20 minute neighborhoods. That can you get to everything you want walkably, if that's the word, uh, within 20 minutes? And that's what the new planning commissioner in Detroit is using as his frame for neighborhood redevelopment in an area that has had seen lots of depopulation. Um, but the short blocks idea is, of course, you know, if you can make it walkable and you can get to your destinations and, and circulate your neighborhood well, it again adds to that feeling of vibrancy. And I think the, the walkability thing that she's putting out there so early, um, we also see now in a city is um, challenged by both impedance factors, like you may be two blocks from the store, but there's an expressway in between you and that store, and so it doesn't feel walkable, and so you may get in your car instead, or um, we have things in Chicago like gang lines, right? So I've uh, work, done some work on the west side with the, um, in North Lawndale, and for example, um, we were moving assets like basketball courts to police station parking lots because it was easier for one as a productive encounter kind of opportunity between police and kids, but that was, it was easier for kids to get to that basketball court because it was on the correct side, correct, of a gang line because they would have to walk much further otherwise to get to the park where they could actually, play, where they wanted to play ball. So these invisible impedance factors, I think, complicate the idea of short blocks. I met Jane Jacobs last week, uh, and I met her the week before, uh, and the week before that. Uh, not her literally, but certainly her, her spirit. Uh, it, it lives on in community activism uh, in Chicago especially. And any time you talk about neighborhood growth, um, what you're talking about is urban change by its very definition. And when you engage urban change, you have two diametrically opposed forces. You have the economic forces that uh, promote change for profitable reasons, for business reasons, for uh, reasons of uh, job growth. Um, and then you have the community interest, which uh, oftentimes just functions as a break. Uh, and Jane, Adam, uh, Jane Jacobs is often, um, I think, unfairly accused of 
uh, sort of being a personification of nimbyism, of just simply saying no, 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 no. I don't want anything. I have my house right here. I have my neighbor's house right there. I don't want to see any change on my block. I don't want an expressway in the block next door. I just want to keep the status quo. That is actually a misinterpretation of what she stood for and what she believed in. Um, I think it's uh, significant that one of the greatest representatives of the community voice in urban planning didn't have an urban planning degree, uh, didn't have a degree in architecture, wasn't an engineer, really had no formal credentials that would justify the amount of power that she had. She was a human being. She was a resident of a city. She lived her life in the fabric that the professionals designed. The arts and cultural program that Mayor Emanuel ambitiously laid out in his first term, uh, for whatever reason, has lost a lot of battles for that ranking in the priority scale. Uh, and I think most people in the arts community uh, are familiar with it and, and know that. So it's a question of mobilizing, uh, demanding, uh, demanding a fair share, uh, and, and making the argument, which I think is a valid argument, that uh, it's an investment. It isn't, it isn't a waste of dollars, uh, that it's an investment that pays off in many ways. I've made that argument recently. Uh, we have a new um, uh, director of the uh, uh, tourism promotion agency called Chew Chicago, and there's a fight every year, Ziggy and I were talking about this uh, before the panel, uh, about promoting, marketing, and advertising Chicago's cultural attractions to an international audience. The, the uh, analysis uh, is, is clear and universal. The people who do this kind of thing for a living, the professional marketers and ad agency people, have a way of measuring the effectiveness of the money that you spend to promote something versus what you get back. And when we promote Chicago as a tourism destination in Europe, it's about a three-for-one return on our investment because the Europeans come to America and they typically go to one of the coasts. And when we get them here, the response is always, I didn't know Chicago was this cool. I didn't know the Art Institute was this awesome. You know, I didn't know the music scene was this vibrant. Well, that's on us. They didn't know it. We know it. We live here. We need to do a better job of telling our story. Uh, one of the things that I think makes this a difficult issue to solve is territorial fragmentation between the wards, uh, simply because the way that the city is subdivided, there are power struggles, and sometimes large neighborhoods are divided into multiple wards, and it's difficult to get cooperation. So as an alderman, as you, from what you see on the board, what can be done to increase cooperation across the city and improve recognition that each ward needs each other ward in order to survive? It's an excellent question. Um, you know, one of the last uh, vestiges of unfettered aldermanic power is uh, with zoning questions. Um, you know, I've been in government a long time, even though I've only been uh, in alderman for a couple of years. Even, you know, Alton, I'm sure, would tell you, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, aldermen had tremendous power over all sorts of things, and there's been just an, a gradual erosion over the years for a variety of reasons. But the one thing that's left uh, is zoning questions. Now, there's a dark side to that, obviously, because you have one person in a ward who can make all sorts of decisions that affect nearby communities that aren't in his ward, as you're alluding to, that may or may not be good for those communities. But I would argue that the benefit of it is, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a measure of accountability. There's nowhere to hide. I'm standing here right now as the person who will be responsible for the zoning decisions that are made in the Finkel Steel site. I can't point the finger of blame. I can't shed accountability. I can't hide behind anything. And I'm elected. I ran for this position. And I talked about what my intentions were going to be as a candidate. And I was blessed enough to win the office over other candidates. So the people had a choice there. They, there, was some, there was another candidate who was saying, don't touch the PMDs, preserve the PMDs. And I said, no, it's time to remove the PMDs and replace them with something else. So the people chose that in an election, and I'm trying to live up to that. And I'm trying to make decisions that are consistent with that, that are transparent, that are clear, and everybody understands where I'm coming from. Now, that's going to get a lot harder because we're just starting this process. So um, hold me accountable. I mean, clearly, that's, that's my message to the voters. I'm the alderman. I have a zoning decision to make, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it with community input. 
uh, I've already had a total of seven community meetings um, before we've even unveiled a draft of a plan. So there's ample opportunities for input, uh, and there's going to be uh, continued ample opportunities for input going, uh, going into the future. Wait, did that answer your question, or was there, was there another part there? That's an answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and someone else mentioned uh, the need for affordability. Oh, wait, there, there was another part of your question. Um, I, a couple of months ago, I voted for an ordinance uh, that basically changed the zoning bonus uh, requirement that in the downtown development area in particular, where um, developers could basically buy their way out of zoning restrictions in order to add density to their project. Now. Much of the money would traditionally go into the low-income housing trust fund, and from there it seemed to get lost. We, we do a good job of collecting money. We don't do a very good job of building money or building low-income housing uh, in the city. So they changed that, and, and now uh, any downtown building that needs to add FAR or wants to add density has to pay into what's called a neighborhood opportunity fund, and that money will be used to spark economic development in those very neighborhoods that you're talking about, that are neighborhoods in the city that are struggling, that lack jobs, that have high crime, that have all sorts of social and economic problems, and they need help, and there's no way to solve those problems without money. So this is to create a fund to address those problems. Uh, I voted for that, and uh, I took a little heat for that uh, in, in certain circles, because basically what I was saying was, yes, take money away from my ward and send it to other wards. Uh, well, it was the right thing to do because we're all in this together as a city. You know, it's it's one city. Ultimately, we're going to rise or fall together. Uh, and and I just felt that you know this was one potential source of funding. Uh, it's a reliable source of funding because I get development proposals almost every day. You know, the 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 boom has not stopped yet. You know, we're still in a construction growth period in in the central part of the city. So there's going to be a reliable source of funds for this new neighborhood opportunity fund for the foreseeable future, and I think good things will come of it, so I voted for it. Now, conversely, I also just introduced an ordinance specific to the PMD uh, that requires 90% of all developer impact money generated within that PMD has to stay in that PMD. So I'm doing the opposite of what I just did by supporting the neighborhood opportunity fund, and the reason is simple, uh, as I went through that laundry list of, of major capital projects that are going to be required for this thing to work, the price is huge. It has to somehow pay for itself. Executive Director of a, a very small theater company, but very long-lasting theater company, Theater Ublek. We've been around for about 28 years. So we started in that sort of magical time at the end of the, of the 80s when Red Moon started. Looking Glass started, uh, Curious Theater Branch was around here. Uh, and we were one of the first, when Ziggy bought this old bank, you know, this, was, this was an old bank, we were one of the first uh, groups to actually meet with him to talk about uh, making it into a theater. And uh, it was just a pile of rubble, basically. Just, and, uh, and, uh, and since that time, we've done shows here at the... Had a great time. We were sort of one of the first arts groups as a bunch of young kids in on the ground floor of Arkansas. Uh, you know, we, lived in, we lived on Division Street in, a, in, a, in an old barber shop, an old abandoned barber shop, where I think we paid $25 a month rent, each of us, about five or six of us living in a rat infested uh, uh, old barber shop right down the street on Division Street, um, which is now probably a gap or something like that. But, uh, uh, so, <laughs> I live in Evanston now, uh, and we're all sort of uh, in the diaspora of our theater company, but we still, I mean, we're opening a show here in, in mid-January, and uh, um, so we have a field, I mean, I just, uh, when Ziggy invited me, Layla invited me to come down, I said, yeah, I'm going to come down just to harken back to those old days. I think this is such an important cultural institution. It's, uh, it's, there's, there's no way to even begin to map how important, how many groups have come through here, how much it's meant to the art scene um, for, this, for this community. What I meant is when you have diversified, clean, a relatively safe neighborhood, then we can do art. It doesn't make a difference that you, uh, you are great and famous, but only 10, 15 people come to your jazz concert. So, uh, <laughs> just, so you are historically... Yeah. Uh, Ziggy's right. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was a great deal of tension with Ziggy between us, our group, and, and him. Not just from the, 
we, we saw him as a, as a gentrifier and as, a, and as someone who was going to just basically clean up the whole place and make it not dirty. So I'm like, did I'm it, Ziggy. Yeah. Did it. Along the lines, and this is one of the things I think there's there's a couple of things because uh, I've got you know I, Wicker Park is an arts arts destination. Um, one of the things that I in thinking about this, and I think it connects with uh, some points that are being made, is that uh, and I think it was ten years ago. Um, I couldn't find the the date of it, but there was a huge city initiative that was in lead with the League of Chicago Theaters where they did a survey and what. Some of the numbers that they figured out was that 5% of the Chicago population goes regularly attends arts events. And 55% of the Chicago population regularly attend sporting events. And then we wonder why there's no fucking money in the arts in Chicago. I think, and so I want, I, I want to point, I, first of all, I just want to make a point in terms of, I think the danger this is a personal thing. I think the danger of positioning ourselves to prove our economic viability in neighborhoods tethers us to money. And, and it tethers us to trying to justify art as an economic thing. When if only 5% of the people in Chicago go see to art, there is no massive economic benefit for the city to say, let's take the public way and give it to I mean, at one point, and this was this is 15 years ago, I tried uh, to get the mayor, daily at the time, to have more than just one Chicago Cultural Center. To have like five or six in neighborhoods. And, and nobody wanted it because there's no money in it. And that's part of the issue. So what, how, do, how do the artists on the panel, how do you guys contend with the fact? I guess the question that I have is, beyond, look at how good we are for the neighborhood which is a non-starting argument, because it's certainly not as good as a parking structure for the neighborhood in terms of taxation and in, in terms of all that economic benefit. What are we doing to increase our percentage from 5% to even 7% of the greater Chicago area? Uh, one of the things that, I, I'm really glad that you're putting it in those terms, and I think that what I was thinking of when you were speaking, um, is that it seems to me like what we're really talking about is art's good for the soul. And you can't really put money on that. And I feel like, I, I grew up in California, and I think about a lot how when I was in school, um, California was the model of an educational system and other systems around the country looked at California as this wonderful place because it had such a great education system. And I was in middle school when we voted proposition, I think it was called 49, I don't remember, I just remember it was the one that said that um, now taxes would not be spread equally across all school districts. So that immediately created a difference between what you had and what you didn't have in the schools. And I am a product of someone who loves the arts because I was exposed to them in the schools. My parents were, my dad was a teacher, my mom worked blue collar jobs. They couldn't afford to be taking us to the theater or to the symphony, but I was exposed to that on a regular basis. We got dance lessons, we got trips to the symphony, we got trips to the theater, we got trips to galleries. That was just part of the education. And I think what we're talking about really is a greater problem or a greater issue. And I don't think it is a problem for the 55% going to, the, no. to sports events. They don't look at it that way. And so it seems I don't have any answers, but all I can think is that my job as an artist is to find ways to expose as many young people to the arts as an avenue of expression, because that's what helped me, that's what saved me, and that's what I see helping and ha having helped other people. I like to take advantage of the fact that Robert is here. Uh, talking about change in 25 years, you're, you're, you're from a nation that has been transformed in the last 25 years in many respects. And I'm wondering whether what your perspective on our, on our uh, efforts uh, might bring to the conversation. For several 
generations, I may say, we, the people of Warsaw used to have uh, a central district with uh, uh, very nice and expensive buildings, with theaters, with institutions, with government offices. Uh, and uh, several other districts, uh, a few of them typical working class, uh, others uh, for more wealthy people, residential districts. So this division uh, has very much survived. I come from, from the other side of the river, uh, from uh, the eastern part of Warsaw, and uh, when I was young, uh, uh, this part of Warsaw called Praga uh, was, uh, I, I liked it enormously because it, it's, uh, I had the feeling that it was like Warsaw, like pre-war Warsaw. The buildings were there, uh, uh, people were there, and uh, this is where, um, in, in a famous marketplace, I, I bought my first pair of jeans, American jeans, when I was a schoolboy. I was a you know, there were a few sizes too big for me, but I was really proud to have them. Uh, and uh, there was, for decades, uh, uh, every, everything was a scarcity. Uh, so there was enough, there wasn't enough food, there was enough uh, uh, stuff at the stores. Uh, whatever you needed, the, there wasn't enough of it. So, um, but when you are a, a teenager, you start going to parties, and you 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 like to have a bottle or two bottles of vodka at the party, uh, but you, you couldn't go to a store because uh, in most likely store didn't have it at the time you needed it. So, what you w w were doing, uh, you you were taking a taxi, going to the old Praga. Uh, uh, this was the the part of Warsaw you wasn't supposed to go after dark. So you, you were going by it with a taxi, you, you rolled down your window, and immediately a guy came with a, and asked you a question, how many? <coughs> and being school people, we could afford at least, well, one, maybe two, if, if we, if we uh, collected money from several people. So we bought the one or two bottles of vodka, and. Uh, were heading back to the party. So this was the culture, this was uh, the, 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 the climate of, uh, of, this, of this old part. Uh, it, it was like weekend park for the Yes, yes, that's the, 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 that's, that's the resemblance that I feel. And, and what happens to now, uh, uh, 20, almost 30 years after uh, the big change, Praga still retains the old buildings, but you have theaters, you have artists with their studios, you have fancy shops and uh, fancy clubs. You have, uh, it's all of a sudden it became popular and why uh, did it become popular? Because the taxes were significantly lower than on the other side. And so in 08, um, the beginning of the double recession, there was a, a whole bunch of great theater companies all went under at the same time. Roadworks, uh, Shattered Globe kind of kind of took a hiatus and came back. Who else closed at that time? Famous, Famous Door. Famous Door. Yeah. Defiant? Yeah, Defiant. Was like the yeah, that, was, that, was like that was earlier. That was before, but they were they were sort of the beginning of that wave, as I recall, yeah. That was before. Yeah, but I think Defiant had more to do with those guys just said, "Yeah, we're we done. Did this. We're done. Yeah. We're, we're we don't want to hand the reins off to the next generation." Yeah, yeah. I think it was an official yeah. statement. Yeah. But um, so, I think that in Wicker Park, we're actually putting up a pretty valiant fight against the corporate gentrification. I mean, I think we're you know Wrigleyville got destroyed um, by the Cubs, and I think Lincoln Park. I don't know what happened to all the art that was happening in the 80s, but it's not there now on a grassroots level. So I think we're actually doing a pretty great job. And, and I think that's because some people um, that have influence in the neighborhood have recognized that if when the arts leave Wicker Park, um, all the energy that brings people here does. And so I do think we need to like 
get more people to tell the business people that are making a lot of money. You know, like if you build a hotel in Toronto, actually, if you build a condominium building above five thousand uh, dollars, so above five stories, every story that you add, you have to like give another X percentage of money to arts organizations within like four blocks. You know, we sh we need to find better ways to have the businesses have a system to help support the art that they are basically feeding off. If I may beg to differ a little bit about government getting out of the way, um, there is a lot of study being done around the world, academic study, about how art and creativity can be an instrument for economic development. And wherever there have been successful models of it, whether it's in Bilbao in Spain or whether it's uh, any part of the world where you look at it, uh, there has always been some sort of a policy decision made someplace. It's not that you know the government is one that's going to have to make the plans and bring everything and do the total investments of it. But at some point, the political decision has to be made that we are going to focus on this type of a development for the creative class, for the arts, and try to see if we can induce some economic activity as a result of that. And what I see, uh, our role is, that, is as a civil society kind of coming together and getting our act together and help make that justification for that. So, I mean, but that, so the, again, just I think this should be a celebration of Ziggy and Layla and this building. Uh, 25 years is amazing what yeah. you've done. Just to, I mentioned that anecdote because he really didn't know what 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 he was doing. Um, maybe still doesn't, but he's made this amazing amazing place. And you just have to look around. I mean, just look at look at this look at these weird seats that we're sitting on. Where do you get this crap? Like, what is this? Look. <laughs> Tell about your next show here. Thank you.